Good morning, good morning, good morning. It's an August day, a bit windy, a bit of low cloud, a bit of traffic. There we go. You notice they've trimmed the hedges. The good burgers of William get very irate when farmers trim their hedges because they imagine that they're mashing up a load of little birdies. But in fact, you are allowed to trim hedges if they are growing onto the roadway. The inside, there's, I don't think you can cut them between March and September, October or something. Anyway, hope you're well. It's Friday, last day of the week. I've been very lucky actually this week, I think. I worked Monday, didn't work Tuesday. Worked Wednesday, didn't work Thursday. And now I'm working Friday. And then next week I'm working all week. Am I? Or do I go on holiday? I might go on holiday on Monday, I'm not sure. But anyway, I'm actually going on holiday holiday the week after. And I think I'm on holiday from Monday. So there you go, so it's my last working day for about three weeks, two weeks. Anyway, we're some months we're really quiet and other months we're really busy, so we've got to the point now where over the year we're okay, so we don't have to worry too much. This August has been very quiet, hence the only work in six sessions. Mind you, you know, having said that, we work... <laughs> You wouldn't think a dentist could work from home, would you? But you can do, you know. If you arrange for the phone to be diverted through, if you're a member of staff, and you don't have to, uh, you, you have to have access, they have to have access to the computer as well. So you have to use, have something like remote Google desktop set up. Go, well, that's the, that's the web address. It's, it's Google remote desktop is what it's called. And uh, then what they can do is they can use their laptop, and everyone's got a laptop now, just to dial into the office computer, and then if somebody rings, they can make them appointments and stuff. And they can do that from home, and uh, the patients don't even know that you're shut. My, my patients, actually, we've sort of tried to train them out of coming to the premises. Partly because it works better for us, and partly because we're a bit off the beaten track, you know. We don't have any, we don't have any um, foot traffic going past. People who occasionally come to the surgery do so because they Google this and found out where we are, and then thought thought I, they're a bit off the beaten track. But I'll see if I can pop in, and then of course they pop in to find that we're shut. Now because we're in an innovation centre, we are. We, there is a reception open, so they can say that no, I'm sorry they're not in today. But then they ask them to give us a ring. And then we deal with whatever they need over the phone. Unless they come in to pay cash. But I always say, if they're going to come, not that we take cash. But if they're coming to, uh, you know, transact anything in person, then I always ask them to uh, come, come in uh, and, and just ring us in advance, you know, let us know. So anyway, uh, well, I was just going to have a quick think together aren't we about how to stay wealthy how to stay wealthy and perhaps about how to get wealthy if you're young because when you're young you're you're worried about getting wealthy when you're my age you tend to already be wealthy enough you know by which I mean I can if I want to buy a coffee or need some spares for my tractor or something, then I can finance that. So let's first of all look at value, okay? These are the things you need to embed in your model. What makes something valuable? Well, it's, it's utility and scarcity. That's easy to remember, isn't it? Utility is literally how useful it is. And scarcity is how many of them there are. So if something's really useful and really scarce, it tends to be really valuable. Uh, if it's useful, but not scarce at all, then you're not going to want to pay much for one. If it's scarce, 
but no use at all, then why would you want to buy one? And if it's neither scarce nor useful, then you can forget it. So, whenever you're evaluating something, ask yourself this question. Is it useful, is it scarce? So let's just take something off the top of my head. Say, say gold, right? Say a gold coin. And by the way, don't buy Krugerrands. You need to buy Britannia's because that's in this money, in this country that's counted as money. So you, when you sell it, you don't pay capital gains tax on it. But let's say a gold coin currently worth about $2,400 because dollars is what, you know, I tend to think in for various things. And um, is it useful? Yeah, I mean, it's pretty, it's pretty liquid in that you can sell it. It's easy to sell. A house is useful because you can live in it. And your main residence is also exempt from capital gains tax. But it's not easy to sell. I mean, I know you could say, yeah, but I can sell it. I'll put it, give it to a state agent. They'll sell it. But will they, you know, will they? Well, how long will it take? Three months? Very lucky. Six months? Still lucky. Nine months? Possibly a year. It could be on the market without selling. So if you needed cash a year ago and you still haven't sold your house, then you're not going to agree that your house is very liquid. Let's talk about uh, capital gains tax. Now, capital gains tax is um, a tax on the increase in price of an asset. Notice I don't say an increase in the value, an increase in the price, right? And that's because, let's say you've got a house that's worth £400,000. Then, let's, in 20 years, it might, be, it might be on the market for £800,000. That doesn't mean that the house has improved itself, or moved itself to a nicer area, or fixed its own roof or anything. In fact, it's almost certainly worse, in a worse condition than it was when you paid £400,000 for it. So the reason why someone's now paying £800,000 for it is because the purchasing power of the money has dropped by 50%, dropped in half. So they're having to pay you twice as many pounds for the same, or substantially the same thing. So uh, a house is, again, is, uh, I mean, I use, I use the example because I'm fed up with people going around saying, oh, you never believe how, how much my house is worth. And I have to keep saying to them, that's not how much it's worth, that's just how much it's gone up in price. And the fact that your house is constantly going up in price is a, a, is a source of great comfort to many, many millions of people across the country. Whereas, in fact, it's not the, the um, as I say, there are two reasons why it may have gone up in price. It could be that the value of the house has gone up. I mean, it could be that all that area suddenly become fashionable or something. But it's far more likely that the purchasing power of the currency has gone down. So it's not really uh, any compensation. It's not really any form, any reason for celebration, as far as you're concerned, uh, that the uh, money's uh, created and you know you're now needing to ask for twice as many pounds for the same the same house. That doesn't mean you're richer. Okay, you've still only got one house. Okay, and you've still only got. An amount of money with with the fixed with the purchasing power of that one house however many pounds that is that's all you've got so don't please don't think you're rich now how does this relate to capital gains tax well the government doesn't admit that the purchasing power of pounds goes down so let's say say you buy let's but say you buy something that is subject to capital gains tax and 10 years later, it's doubled in, in price. What they'll want is they'll want a slice of that. They'll want a slice of your asset. Even though that asset may well not have increased in value at all. And because it hasn't increased in, in value, there's been no gain. You haven't gained anything. You still own the same asset. You bought it, you're selling it. Okay, you're selling it for more pounds, but that's because the value of the pounds gone down. There's nothing to do with any gain that you may have made. You're just getting more pounds for it, and the, and the government then turns around and says, no, we want like 20% of 
of the extra pounds. Now, because as we know that the government printing money is the main cause for money to uh, lose its purchasing power, they're getting two bites of the cherry, aren't they? Because they printed a load of money, let's say doubled the money supply, and uh, they've got the benefit of spending all that extra money, that other, that half of the money supply. It's all right, mate, I'm only tiny. And what's happened is you've, um, your capital, your, your goods are insulated from that tax, that inflation tax. And so what they're doing is they're saying, well, we are going to have some of that. We've had, we've debased the currency. We've had half the currency. We've had half your incomes. And now we want half of anything you've got squirreled away in, in terms of goods. And, uh, Milton Friedman, who was a very wise and good economist, and, and there's a quite a bit of stuff about him on the internet. Look up some of his, his little lectures on inflation and stuff like that if you really want to understand it. He first, well, he, he definitively proved that inflation is down to the government printing money and not to any sort of supply side shocks or uh, demand side shocks, although they do have a, like a minor uh, they do it to affect inflation on the fringes, on the periphery. So let's not get too far, let's not wander too far, oh, far off into the weeds. So Friedman was, he said that capital gains tax needed to be adjusted for inflation. Because if something, if you own something and it's gone up in price, then you, you haven't made a gain. All that's happened is you've You've been affected. Your that asset has been affected by inflation. Insofar as you need, you need more pounds to buy it. But you still own the same asset, and he's quite right about that. And the government really should adjust all the gains, capital gains, by inflation. But they don't want to do that because they know that if they if they had to do that, almost always, where, where would the gain be? What would the gain be? I mean, I know if you buy something like a Mickey Mantle baseball collector's card and all of a sudden it, it becomes valuable, then you could say that you've had a gain. Why the government would have been entitled to part of it, I don't know. But, uh, but I mean, you could argue that, that that's that's not an inflationary gain. But, but most gains are not like that. They're, they are inflationary. So they are unfair. So here we are in a situation where we've had a lot of inflation in recent years and as dentists we have to decide how to react. So let me talk about from the dental surgery point of view first of all. You're fortunate in a way, depending on what type of dentist you are, I mean if you're working for the health service or you're in a salaried position. <coughs> Excuse me. Then you're not so fortunate because you know you're on a salary and you have to rely on your employer adjusting your salary to keep up with um, the reduced purchasing power of the pounds that they're paying you in. So, and that may may not always be the case. In fact, it's usually not the case. The uh, review body always said when. Uh, uh, times were good and we asked for a decent pay rise to uh, put us up there with the private sector dentists oh this is the NHS dentist but put them on you know make them comparable they used to say no we're not going to pay you as much as dentists earn in the private sector because when things go bad then what's going to happen is they they shoot up like fireworks when things are going well but when things are going bad then they their salaries go right down or they might lose their jobs. You know, they might get put on part-time. Whereas you, that won't happen to you. Your salaries won't go down. We won't put you on part-time. You've got the security of having an income, although it's not as much as you'd like, at least it doesn't go down. Which is a bold-faced lie, because 
when uh, the economy did do badly, the review body actually recommended a, a low increase for us, lower than inflation or zero increase or, or pay freeze, which is what the doctors uh, came up against. And uh, when we, you know, and then and then uh, to add insult to injury, they used to recommend something to the government, and then the government then cut it again. So we were in double jeopardy. And uh, <clears throat> so we actually did badly when things were going well, and we did badly when things were going badly. Go on, Fleet Farm, get a move on. So, if you're in the private sector and you're self-employed, you know, small businessman or subcontractor to the NHS as we used to be, then you are lucky in a way because what you've got, you've got complete autonomy and complete control over your prices. So, for example, if inflation is 10%, you can put your prices up 10%. If you need to pay your staff more to stop them leaving, then you can pay your staff more than 10%. You can, you can adapt. This is why inflation kills people financially, because they can't adapt. If you've retired and you've accepted an annuity or a fixed pension or you know, a final salary uh, pension or a defined contribution pension or something, and everything's uh, fixed, then Inflation will murder you because it won't go up, your pension won't go up as fast. And a lot of people, millions of people, tens of millions of people discover this. But they only discover it after they've retired. They don't give it a thought when they're working. You know, I've got an uncle who was in the fire service and he retired on what he thought at the time was a bloody good pension. And then, but a few years of inflation later, he suddenly realised that he was going to be on the breadline, and uh, you know, started really, really worrying about his money because there's nothing he can do. It's not like he can go back to fighting fires part time or anything. These are the people who are shacking, stacking shelves in B and Q, or working on the Tesco's checkout. Huh. That's two ambulances today. Must be a nice day to have a heart attack. So, <clears throat> so there you go. So, that, I mean, that's how you respond. But what you've got to do is you've got to make sure that you do respond. Because if you overdo it and put your prices up too much, then uh, what will happen is obviously you lose patience. I mean, it's not so likely because there's such a shortage of dentist then it's not so likely that you'll lose patients but the um, but the thing is to put your prices up and put them up regularly by which I mean like once a year in April or something don't think oh I'm doing all right this year I won't I won't need to put my prices up this year because um, next year what will happen is you'll think oh I'm not doing so well I haven't put my prices up for two years I need to do a stonking increase and then, if you do, if you then do do a stonking increase after two years or three years, then then that the patients are going to notice that, you know, like five percent a year or something, they don't notice. But Ten or fifteen percent, they're going to start thinking, "Hello, last time I had a fill in, it was uh, 140 quid. Now it's now it's 170." So. A relative of mine who's quite wealthy. Her husband died, left her a bit of dosh. And, uh, you know, I couldn't resist the temptation to talk to her about Bitcoin, which she hasn't bought, which I can't, I can quite understand. I didn't really understand that. I didn't understand why, if you were wealthy and you could buy Bitcoin, why you wouldn't. And the answer is that. Uh, if you're wealthy and you know things are going quite well, you don't really want to jeopardise that. And the first objection you'll find out about Bitcoin from wealthy people is that it's too volatile. That's all they say. It's too volatile. And what they're saying is that I'm worth say two million, and if I buy it, I don't want my financial advisor to come back to me at the end of the year 
and say, well, you know, Mr. So-and-so, you know, you know, you were worth two million, uh, and now you're worth one one million eight hundred thousand. That is absolutely not. Well, <laughs> that's going to get them fired, isn't it? So they don't want anything that's got any downside. They'd rather have um. They'd rather have a a gradual increase. They'd rather be able to say like, you're, you're two million now. You're two two million fifty thousand, or you were two million now. You're two million. 100,000 or even 20,000. What they won't do is say that the uh, the 20% the inflation we've had in the last uh, four or five years means that that 2,100,000 can only buy what 1,800,000 could have bought when I started managing your money. Uh, and, of course, and a lot of people sit there fat, dumb and happy with a financial advisor being told that the number go up in the same way as you know house house price go up they're just like well look at me you know i never thought i'd be a millionaire and now i'm living in a house worth a million pounds and uh that's fine everyone's going to be a millionaire sooner or later <laughs> so don't you know it's just a case of when you personally get there anyway so perhaps on the way home i might think of a few uh a few things you know that you could perhaps do financially just to um, insulate yourself from the the worst of uh, any financial downturn but just uh, don't forget that so utility scarcity and uh, capital gains tax you have to understand those first all right I'll uh, time for work I'll talk to you later bye